Greetings, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. You are in for a great show. Um, I am Laurel Morgan, and I will be your Master of Ceremony for tonight. Before we start, I would like to take a second to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones. I can guarantee you won't be bored tonight, and we're trying to avoid distractions for our wonderful speakers. I would also like to thank our wonderful teachers for all their support and guidance, and welcome to the stage, Mr. Corey Boyce.
thirteen billion two hundred eighty six million three hundred sixty thousand eight hundred and seventy two dollars in box office sales one billion four hundred eighty one million one hundred ninety nine thousand six hundred and fifty one tickets sold so far in the year 2018 over two thousand movies are released annually every movie with an average budget of sixty five million dollars hundreds to thousands of employees make up a single film production crew it took two thousand nine hundred and eighty four people to create the movie avatar and why yes I know there are some big bucks in the film biz. But why are movies so popular? What is it that draws us, captivates us? What is the reason behind why movies are at their highest numbers in box office releases? The answer is stories. Stories are the most basic form of communication and have existed since the time of the first Homo sapiens sharing their experiences on the walls of ancient caves in Africa. Stories are what American natives pass down by word of mouth, generation to generation, teaching their sacred traditions and historical tales. Stories are the most effective form of human empathy. We tell stories every day, catching up with a friend, explaining a concept, showing a new perspective. Stories are how we connect, grow, and understand. So now I will share with you a story of how I became fascinated with film as a means for my art of storytelling. Ever since I performed my first improvised dance on the correlation between life and death at the age of three, on my hometown's local tavern stage, I was hooked on storytelling. And it became a forte for me. The number of times people have come up to me and requested I do a one-man show attests to this. I learned to utilize storytelling around the age of five. My father and I lived in the isolated town of Madrid, New Mexico. Total population, 300. There, my papa owned a fine art gallery where we met and conversed with tourists from all around the world, all walks of life. I learned that the best way to sell art was to engage the customer in some sort of entertainment, such as a story. I found it was hardly ever the art that was being sold rather than the story that was being told along with it. When I was 12, I had the privilege of working with Vivian Vance's I Love Lucy's co-star, sister, Luann Graham. It was then that I became hooked on acting. I had done a couple of skits for school talent shows, but no one gave me the confidence that Luann did. It was also around this time that I became obsessed with movies and series. This was mainly due to the fact that I love watching human interactions being portrayed on the big screen. And in some strange way, I felt that I was there, sharing their experiences with them. But it wasn't until I took film class, my junior year of high school, that the art of film really left its mark on me. I had loved watching classics such as Titanic, Gone with the Wind, and The Sound of Music. But once I entered film class, I entered a whole new world of the original art of on-screen storytelling. I started watching films such as Sunset Boulevard, Singing in the Rain, Citizen Kane, and The Great Dictator. I started to pay attention not only to the acting aspects, but began to appreciate the artistry and nuances that went into filming and editing these masterpieces. Now, fast forward a bit. It was early fall of my senior year. The warm, damp skies were filled with thrills of new beginnings. The summer prior, I had made up my mind to do a film involving dance. But how? What would the character be like? What would its story be? That I could not answer. So I began the year as a bushy-tailed, bright-eyed, dedicated senior project student. Efficient in every aspect of my project, except for the paper portion and other classwork that would magically appear on due dates I knew not of. I went on to gain a mentor whom I've met with more than 20 times since August. I became absorbed with learning. I had never studied so much for a human biology test as I did study for this enigmatic soon-to-be short film. But I was enamored with learning. I needed to study, 
so that I could craft a story with meaning and create one that was worthy of my pride. I made a point to research one to two hours every day, as well as network another 30 minutes. My father had even purchased six books for me on the art of filmmaking. So I dabbled in cinematography, camera angles, and equipment, as well as watched and studied tons of student and professionally done short films. I had studiously taken down a total of 300 pages in notes. To be honest, I was both surprised and impressed that my head stayed firmly attached to my neck the first half of the year. Because I also took it upon myself to create my own personal dance regimen, which consisted of studying Misty Copeland's book, Ballerina Body, 30 minutes of intense stretching, as well as another 30 minutes of ballet technique. I did this five to seven days a week. I also took up ballet twice a week at Elements Dance Factory, for good measure. And since this did not seem like nearly enough already, I took up acting classes at the Arden Theater in Philadelphia, as well as drove, dove into Stella Adler's book on the art of acting. Working on dance and theater technique was how I implicated method acting into my project as well. But then, out from the horizon, winter term rolled in. That was it. Fun time was over. It was time to get into the nitty gritty make a plan A, B, and C. And so, I devised a schedule. The script and screenplay were to be complete during winter break. Filming, completed by spring break, with three weeks buffer time. And editing was to be completed on spring break. Simple, easy, totally doable. But before I go into more depth about the creation of my short film, I would like to give you a brief story that is symbolic of what started happening throughout my project. It was indeed a funny thing. I found that if I focused on one aspect of film in particular, especially when there was a problem, somehow, almost magically it seemed, it would resolve itself. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Okay, Optimus Aspen, problems don't magically solve themselves. Well, guess what? I found, with a pinch of pride and a whole lot of passion, they can. And this was proven to me when I was on my way home to Belize for winter break. I had missed my flight. Yep, right off the bat, missed it. So after being turned coldly away by multiple uncaffeinated, cranky airport assistants, several sessions of fatigue sobbing, it was 6.30 a.m. And multiple phone calls to my parents, I comprised a plan. I would go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and stay with some family there for a couple days until I could get on the next flight to Belize. And so I arrived in sunny Florida, to have found a place to stay, and I was thrilled to have found a place to stay, and to find that they were actually pleasant relatives. As I conversed with my dad's cousin, Brent Carr, I soon learned that he spent many years in radio and specialized in editing. Wait a sec, did you just say editing? So that's a coincidence. I had put word out for an editor and could not find anyone experienced enough to teach me and help put together a full-length short film. So as you can imagine, I was quick to take advantage of this. It was only a short 24 hours later that I hesitantly brought up the question, would it be all right for me to come down on a spring break to edit my short film? And as Providence would have it, a trip was planned and I had found myself an editor. Look at that. And this very thing would happen in other areas of my project as well. I had written down, find music. I had been looking for months and could not find a song that would define my film. It was that very day that I found music to inspire the pivotal dance scene that takes place in the film. And I wrote down other things like, find a cinematographer who works with dance. It was only a couple days later that Mr. Boyce came up to me and gave me the information for Brianne Lermont, who had worked with filming dance before, and was available to shoot the final scene. But not all trials were solved just by writing it down on a sheet of paper. I also found that I began to cultivate a mindset, one that taught me to take a deep breath and put one foot forward. So I called it the one step at a time plan. And I didn't even realize I was doing it until a few people pointed out to me that I was a resourceful problem solver and slow to give up. And at first I thought, aw, what a nice compliment. 
But then I realized that this was just my way of working through situations and living in the moment. You see, one of my favorite parts about working on this film was that I was so invested in the present moment to achieve a final goal that I really didn't think much of anything else. And I was obsessed with the adrenaline rush I would get on set after having worked so many hours in preparation the week before. I became good at working to the point of perfection. Then, once on set, letting all that go to just enjoy. I think it was this mindset that made Senior Project such a valuable and much needed experience. But now, back to Nikki. Wait a second. I've been talking this entire time and I didn't even mention Nikki? Okay, all right. Um, let's go back to winter break. I had a concept, but I didn't have a story, let alone a character in a story. I remember sitting on the kitchen counter, frustrated tears welling up in my eyes, not being able to think of a story I could do. My mother impatient, patiently listened to me and came up with potential concepts that went in one ear and straight out the other. So I took a deep breath and I used my one step at a time plan and decided to take a brief nap. <laughs> when I woke up, inspiration struck. Flashdance, a movie about a woman taking on a stereotypical man's job as a welder during the day and a cliche woman's profession as a dancer at night. The dichotomy was just what I needed in a character. I had been studying the 80s as a possible theme because it was an era that I genuinely disliked. <laughs> And if I was going to make a character, she had to be as different from me as possible. I had also been discussing the Russian ballet with my mother, um, who grew up hearing about it as a child. And thus, the strict staccato of Russian ballet and the vab and vibrance of the 80s collided to form my character, Nikki, a dancer with an attitude. The film became about Nikki's journey to find her purpose, thus explaining the question asked at the beginning of the film. Why do I dance? I decided that the question would never be fully answered within the film because it would take away from the viewer's own experience and interpretation. So, Nikki was born, the character I would play. Multiple people got to see this so-called Nikki, especially around the dorm where I would have just gotten my makeup and hair done by my wonderfully talented makeup artist, Emily Martin. I would usually be wearing a leather jacket, four-inch heels, oversized hoop earrings, and a fake nose piercing. But the funny thing about Nikki is she and I are very different people. It was quite entertaining to see people's reactions to my Nikki self as opposed to my everyday up to dee self. Nikki was reserved, mean, a little salty, and a girl of very few words. And then there I would be, snapping in and out of character. This threw my crew off sometimes, especially when I was intensely in character. For instance, there's this one scene where Nikki is actually crying. And so there I was, tears welling up in my eyes, streaming down my face. And then I would look back to the crew and smile and say, OK, let's do another take. Man, I loved that. Their reactions were priceless. But sooner or later, all things come to an end, or at least a bookmark, as I'd like to call it. This is because I don't think art can ever really be complete. It can only grow, change, and be observed. The bookmark I'm talking about was the premiere of Nikki. Now, because I am an overachiever, I wanted that Mitchell Performing Arts Center to be packed with at least 300 people. But we had a pretty good turnout at 50. It was only about a week after that that it started to hit me. I was staying up late for no reason. I spent more and more time vegging out in front of the computer watching Amazon Prime. It was horrible. I didn't even really start to understand what was happening in this mini depression until it was brought to my attention that I actually might be missing the hustle and bustle of working on a set for the purpose of something I'm passionate about. And I missed Nikki. I had spent about 500 hours on the film, and even the 80s has grown on me since. <laughs> it
it is now a permanent part of my wardrobe. In a way, it was like missing a really close friend that you got to learn inside and out. I knew all of her struggles, loves, relationships, passions. And all of a sudden, it was like we broke up. Nikki just lived on a screen in a short film. And that's when I understood. That is why films are at their highest numbers in box office releases. Because films live on. That is why a film can be watched over and over again, and something new can be discovered each time. Every film is a story, and within it are the stories of those who join together to create that work of art. So now, I'd like to thank a few of those who helped guide me through my story, as well as Nikki's. Two of these individuals are Lisa Huber and Kevin Buss. Without their consistent support and positive outlooks on set, I am not sure if I would have made it through the process, let alone remain sane along the way. It's true. I want to thank my mentor, Andrew Sullivan, for his constant support and invaluable insights on all aspects of directing and producing a film. He taught me that no one would ever know my project as well as I do, and to take advantage of my unique perspective and vision. I also want to thank my editor and mentor, Brent Carr, for the countless hours he has spent with me and, and in supporting me in both my project and future aspirations. I'm so blessed to have met you and look forward to accidentally missing my flight in the near future. <laughs> I want to thank Emily Martin, who put in numerous hours to create the look of Nikki and bring her to life. And finally, I'd like to thank Mr. Boyce for showing me how to take pride in my work, even when it's not as incredibly remarkable as I would have wanted it to be. And thanks to everyone else who helped make this film into reality. I wish I could mention each and every one of you. Directing, producing, acting, dancing, and editing, editing a 20-minute long short film was no simple task. But you made it worth it, and a journey that is well worth the ride. You taught me that it's not the product that matters so much as the story shared and told along the way. So now I'd like to warmly invite all of you to come to my second screening of Nikki on June 10th at 7 o'clock, right over there at the Mitchell Performing Arts Center. All proceeds will be donated to the Actors Fund to help starving artists like myself. <laughs> and flyers are up here on stage to take home with you. And that's a cut. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. And I would like to ask if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask, then feel free. This is your time. Bring it out. Yes? You said it was important that Nikki be different than you are. Why is that? OK, so you said that it was important for Nikki to be different than me. That was because I really wanted to make sure that the film was something that could be enjoyed from a perspective that it wasn't like my personal story. I wanted it to be kind of separate, separated from me entirely as an individual. Because that way, I can show, hey, look, I can act, and also at the same time show um, how to appreciate just the story being told on screen, rather so much than me as a person being told on screen. Thank you. Good question. Oh, yes? Or is there any ways that Nikki and I are similar? Yes. <laughs> probably, probably yes. I, I said that she was reserved. Actually, I'm sometimes a little reserved and also sometimes a little salty. So I guess I really more of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, think I kind of more just channeled it and like upped it up a notch. So my saltiness is a little like more on the DL and then hers was just like all out there, like take it. So yeah, thank you, good question. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am, and so I will be pursuing this going forward. I'm actually going to be moving to LA this coming October um, just to have at it and take my try in acting. Thank you, good question. All righty, cool, and then, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. How do you turn this off? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I just love how Aspen brought her ideas to life through an actual character. Um, we're about to have a brief 10 to 15 minute intermission so that the judges can gather their thoughts. You can find refreshments um, in the back hallway, out those doors, and towards the back of the building. Um, I'd just like to ask that you enjoy your refreshments in the hallway and not bring them back into the auditorium. Enjoy.
All right, everybody.
Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> With all that background and the suggestions of plenty of people, I took Senior Project. I thought for most of the summer about what I could do. That was when one of the mottos of Senior Project first came up. The stretch. What would the stretch be in working on just another go-kart or mini bike? The ultimate goal for me in life is to work on old cars or modify them to a state of fast and fun. So that got me thinking. I scoured Craigslist every single night for any sweet deal I could find on a project car without letting my parents know that's why I was saving up. <laughs> I worked hard over the summer fixing landscape equipment and burning my skin from welding. Sounds painful, which is true, but it was fun. At the end of the summer, the time had come to ask my parents if I could blow most of my savings on another car. This to them was already crazy because there's no shortage of cars in the Willie family. <laughs> I twisted their arms using Senior Project as a great reason for this. <laughs> After a while, I had made a down payment on a 1974 Chevy Vega GT Camback. It's a mouthful. So from now on, I'll just refer to it as the Vega. I worked on it for the final days of summer, starting a YouTube channel, and already loving the process of working on a car. I wish summer would never end. Time marches on, though, so school began. Every time Senior Project rolled around, I would raise my hand when asked the question, who knows what they want to do with their project? I hope my peers didn't get bored of hearing all of my car talk. <laughs> though the beginning portion of the year was to work on the paper, most days I would go home and do whatever I could to the Vega. I dove in, not worried about messing up a real gem. The Vega is not exactly an expensive classic. So snapping a few bolts would not be the end of the world. I maintained my record of cutting up my hands and stinking up the house. Some things never change. Eventually, the time to write the dreaded senior project paper came around. Of course, being the hands-on guy that I am, I saw the paper as just another hurdle to jump over. I just wanted to work in the garage all day, instead of researching. This slowly changed, though, as I got my paper mentor, Max Blair, from Bryn Athen College. His first car was a Vega. <laughs> <laughs> he knows why they're terrible. <laughs> we met almost every week and brought both of our interests to the table. Mr. Blair incorporated physics with the Vega, making things blend together really nicely. I ended up writing about why the Vega was such a lemon and how other companies that seemed to do so well could go under in the snap of your fingers. I found that when the paper was done, I had a huge sense of fulfillment and a much greater knowledge of the Vega itself. Something that is a very good idea when working to seriously modify any car is to do plenty of research about it. The research paper actually forced me to learn all that I could about the Vega and its history. I learned why it was so horrible to begin with <laughs> and how I could maybe remedy that in the future. General Motors rushed the Vega project, leaving it with a terrible engine and bad rust proofing. Mine was no exception. The engine was completely seized up and every panel on the car had at least some surface rust on it. Though I had already begun work on the Vega in August, it was great to have the senior project class switch to the actual project portion after Christmas break. I couldn't actually work on the Vega during class, but I could go home and do research or run to an auto parts store, something I did countless times. The Vega project came with plenty of problems to overcome, the first one being that the terrible original engine was completely destroyed and would cost five grand to rebuild. That's not money I had to spend. So the cheaper and way cooler option was to drop a V8 engine in there, probably at least double the power. There were many kits made for this in the 70s, so finding engine mounts was not a problem. I bought the V8 from the same place I bought the Vega, building my relationship with the shop owner. It goes to show you never know where life will take you. I had never thought I would do a V8 swap with the Vega. I also did not think I would end up working for the man who sold me both. It wasn't too tough to get hired. I've been to Rob's restoration plenty of times to drool over all the classics he had sitting outside. He was always friendly enough to show me what he was working on. I kept showing up, and I eventually bought the Vega. 
I would come back to ask him advice, and sometimes even for free parts. One of those days he said, want to work for me this summer? I was beyond stoked by this. It's basically my dream job. So from the Vega project, I had a solid summer job lined up for after I graduate. Sweet. <laughs> after buying the engine from Rob, I installed it and slowly checked everything off of my cardboard list. <laughs> I called it the master list, with exclamation point. I could talk all day about all the problems I had to overcome with this project. By the time the Vega was running and driving, I put about 300 hours into it. The Vega taught me that with the right mindset, you can do anything. It was a great source of lessons for other areas of life as well, teaching me to shrug off the little problems and just keep grinding. This build could not have been possible without all the support I have gotten. For starters, I can't thank my project mentor, David Lexi, enough for helping me out with the V8 Vega. I could always expect emails with all of the information I needed to know from him. I could look forward to learning more every Saturday we met. I could even use his tools. He helped me with actually dropping the drivetrain into the car, as well as countless other things. He was pivotal in my success this year. Small world, too. Rob painted Mr. Lexi's project car for him. It has been one thing after the other, buying all new parts when the old rusty ones failed. I can say now with confidence that the Vega will have a completely new drivetrain, along with brand new braking system, all around. Those things were really needed for my service piece of my senior project. I had to drive the Vega onto a trailer to get it to school. Since building a car, especially the kind I built, doesn't really benefit society. <laughs> I needed to come up with something. I mean, I couldn't just make the neighbor's ears bleed and not do anything in return. <laughs> so I had an event to teach people how to check oil and change a tire. There's a way to get back while showing people my pride and joy. I hope someday I can build cars like the Vega for those who are into it. I would like to end this with saying thank you to everyone involved for your support. You know who you are. I could not have even put a dent in this thing without you all, and I'm truly blessed to have had the opportunity to work on a classic like this. I hope to do this kind of thing for the rest of my life. I think I could stand to see a couple more of those grins. Hopefully someday soon the Vega will be ripping around the street, legally, <laughs> with the guy behind the wheel, smiling ear to ear. For any who are interested, the Vega is here today out in front at the auditor uh, in front of Benade. Anyone who wants to s come see it is welcome to during the coming intermission. For the final time, thank you all. And for the gearheads, keep on wrenching. You never know where it will take you. Any questions? Yes, sir? Uh, so what's left to get it street legal? <laughs> so he wants to know what's left to get it street legal. Uh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just a big list of some smaller problems, just kind of things that aren't very fun to do. Um, but I'm hoping over the summer with my job, I'll be able to throw a bit more money at the Vega and actually get it to where I can legally drive it around the street. Okay. Good question. Right here in the middle? Not sure yet. Uh, about inspection, that's, that's been a, a big question. Uh, I need to do more research on how to most easily get it to pass. Good question. Um, what was the process like to get the actual V8 engine into your Vega? So he wants to know about the process of dropping a huge V8 into the Vega. I actually had it a bit easy. The engine bay is pretty big, but um, it, it took a ton of test fitting and moving things around. I actually moved the power steering pump from up top on the engine down to the bottom, and it hangs down below the car, so like it probably hit a speed bump and destroy it. <laughs> 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 but uh, it just, it's, it stinks because you put it in, you say, hey, it looks pretty, but then you gotta rip it back out, and I probably did that about 10 times, so. Good question. 
This is going to be the last one right here. Yeah, considering the original husk, the labor you put into it, and the new and improved parts, how would you go about valuing your big guy? Valuing? Hmm. Well, here's what, uh, the value of the Vega. Here's what I know is that the roof rack alone, somebody tried to buy it for $500 <laughs> before I bought the Vega. Um, I, I'm not sure where I would put it just because the way I built it in some ways was just get it done, get it on the road, and it's a little sketchy. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not sure where to value it at, but uh, hopefully someday soon the value will go up when I'm actually driving it around. <laughs> and not on bald tires. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What a ride, am I right? We're, we're about to have another intermission, and if Drake didn't sell it, which I think he did, I would highly recommend checking out the Vega. It's pretty sick. And I wanted to just say a word or two. Um, believe it or not, some of you might have heard some issues we've been having with technical difficulties. Um, I just wanted to say, if you saw things just
hope you all enjoyed your intermission. Up next, we have a mad scientist from Maryland who always seems to be scheming something. Let's see what he has in mind now. Please welcome Tim Radcliffe. Playing with fire. What does that have to do with designing and building an electronic fuel injection system for small engines? Well, by the way, try saying that 10 times fast. <laughs> well, believe it or not, they have a lot to do with each other. Well, at least in my case, they do. Let's start from the beginning. I began senior project with high aspirations, and obviously, ending with them too. I wanted to do something big, something intellectually challenging, and especially something relevant to my future. So, I started off the year with lots of ideas bouncing around in my head. Multi-fuel engine, multi engine control systems, gas turbines, the possibilities seemed truly endless. Now you're probably one saying to yourself, wow, this guy is either really smart or really stupid. <laughs> and well, I can confidently say that I am definitely the latter. A high schooler trying to involve himself in something like this? This is the kind of stuff an MIT graduate works on for a year and a half. This guy must be crazy to set, up himself, set himself up for, for failure like this. Well, well, I can assure you, there's a method to my madness. The real journey began after I came to the unhappy realization that I couldn't really do anything revolving around mechanical design. This is mainly because of the stark lack of tooling I had available to me in Bernathan. Turns out, no one really does this kind of stuff around here. Um, so, I needed to make a jump. Well, kind of a leap. A giant leap. I decided to get involved with electronics and programming, things I had absolutely no experience in before. Thus, the project that married my mechanical experience with my electronic inexperience was born. Designing an electronic fuel injection, injection system. EFI is basically an engine's fuel system that's controlled by a computer. Instead of something mechanical, like a carburetor, an engine with EFI uses fuel injectors that are controlled by a small computer called an ECU, engine control unit. Now hold on before I lose you. This isn't as complicated as it's uh, hold on a minute. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. Well, at least that's what I thought when I started. So let's begin my journey, shall we? My first obstacle was learning code. Because I needed some way of making the computer... Wait a minute. Compu <laughs> computer... Computer... <laughs> do what I wanted. Computers speak in a very different, more logic-based language than we do, so it can be pretty tough for someone just starting out, like me. I decided to use the basic C computer language, and that was the best fitting because most microcontrollers, like the computer I would eventually use in my project, use integrated, integrated development environments that use C. Learning C seemed like an enormous process at first, using online classes, forums, how-tos, and even YouTube. Many times in the beginning, it seemed like a task like this was way above me. But bit by bit, my progress shone. From writing simple programs that processed arithmetic to programs that you could more or less talk to. By then, I had pushed hard enough to where programming was, dare I say, easy. I went from wholly doubting my abilities to breezing through functions and commands like it was second nature in a month and a half. This big step in my progress taught me an extremely important lesson. I learned not to sell my ability short. With this, with this incredible boost of morale, I set off on an even bigger adventure, learning my way through digital e electronics from the ground up. This was by far the most difficult task I faced during my journey, having, having to turn my computer's commands into physical actions, as you can imagine, may get a little confusing. But like before, I pushed down my walls of doubt and persevered. Then came the final test. 
I needed to take all of what I had learned and put it on an engine and fire it up. Great. Luckily, just in time, I got in contact with my mentor, Owen Frazier. Owen was an incredible resource for advice on actual fuel injection systems because, of course, being the owner of an auto repair shop called Autotronics. He gave me invaluable insights on the things I had missed or overthought when writing my programs or listing my parts. Um, above that, he accommodated my busy schedule for tight hours when, he had schedule, when, he, when we had to schedule our meetings. One thing I greatly regret, regret about my journey is not being able to connect with Owen more. It was just so jam-packed with things to do, I found it hard to find time to schedule meetings. Now that all is said and done, I'm pretty proud of my project. Not just the result, but the journey also. I've learned an incredible amount during my time in Senior Project. And now that the software I designed is going to be open sourced, or free for everyone online, I'm glad I'm making a difference in many other people's lives as well as mine. I've learned not to sell myself short in what I'm capable of, not to mention all the information. But there's still a question I haven't quite answered yet. What does playing with fire have to do with building an EFI system? Well, I wanted to teach people that you can do absolutely anything you put your mind to, regardless of how complicated it may seem. I wanted to show people that being quick to let ideas and tasks fly over your head because they seem way too out of reach is just wrong and unwise. I'm just a kid in high school. I built this thing from the ground up. You can too. And that, my friends, is how I'm playing with fire. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. What's that motor from? This, um, this is just a stock um, Harbor Freight Sales Disease. It's, oh, okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's just a stock Predator 420cc um, electric start. So you just grab it. Yeah. Um, it's a mid range, it's a mid range displacement, which is why I chose it. Anything else? Yes, sir. Does your system actually work? Um, it's, <laughs> it is, if I had gas and I did all the, uh, and if I plumbed it up, it probably would fire. Um, but it's uh, still, it's a, still a prototype. Okay. Any, <laughs> any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm, pl I am planning on going to school for mechanical engineering. Thank you. Yes? So my service piece, it is, it's still, it's scheduled. My, it's scheduled to happen actually this week. I'm going to do a chapel service for the Academy of the New Church right on that stage. Now, was it just me, or could you actually see the gears turning? Because I saw, I saw something going on in there, and it's pretty cool. Up next, we have another brief intermission, um, and I'll see you all back here pretty soon. Wait. Oh.
Yeah, I like it too. Especially because everybody's sitting on the edges. So like, I can't get a spot. Are you have the speakers? Thanks, it's actually really fun. Oh, yeah, that was... It's actually really fun. I kind of want to, actually. That would be so fun. Now, often in high school, the term two-faced is used with kind of a negative connotation. But you can often find our next presenter creating a second face for somebody. And I don't know, but that's the only kind of two-faced I like to see. Please welcome to the stage the all-around amazing artist, Emily Martin. Project was about? That's right. Makeup! Are you confused? Well, don't worry. People often are. My project was centered around a specific kind of makeup called special effects makeup, which focuses on bringing the imagination to life on stage and on screen. I was exposed to special effects makeup as a child from watching movies like Halloween Town and The Wizard of Oz. Fantasy creatures and horrific monsters always fascinated and excited me. My childhood was my true introduction to makeup, but I didn't begin practicing it until about three years ago. Driven by my love for all things mythical, I've been pursuing the hobby ever since. Coming into Senior Project, I knew makeup was the perfect topic because it's not something I want to pursue as a career, so I could dedicate an entire year to it before being too busy. A year sounds like a long time, but trust me, it isn't. A year at the academy is a mere second as a senior. With that limited time frame, I needed to choose one thing in the makeup world to focus on. And given that my prior experience in makeup consisted of fake cuts and bruises, which are pretty small, simple projects, I decided that I would practice making molds and prosthetics like they do in my favorite childhood movies. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where the plaster comes into play. For those who don't know, prosthetics are defined as artificial body parts. In makeup, they're often made of makeup grade gelatin, latex, silicone, or foam latex. Making a prosthetic requires going through a long and complicated process that can take a couple tries to perfect. When I made my prosthetics, I started out by casting my model's noses in plaster and then sculpting new noses on top of them. After sculpting was finished, I made molds with the plaster and I removed the clay from the initial sculpts. Finally, I poured latex into the molds and I fit the original nose casts into them, like this. Once they were dry, the prosthetics peeled out of their casts, and they fit perfectly to the models that I created them for. I don't blame you if you didn't quite catch all of that. In simpler terms, plaster has become my best friend. <laughs> I make the process sound more complicated than it is, but it does have its many trials. For example, I filled the mold with many different materials before settling on latex, and a lot of my molds cracked or got stuck to the bottom of the bowls that they were created in. Prosthetic making was a new world of makeup I had never exposed myself to before, and was quickly picking up despite the issues I was faced with. It's important to mention here that although I was a fast learner, I wasn't perfect the first time around, and that was not an option for me. Like I mentioned, a year at the academy goes by in a second, and as a senior project student, only half of the year was dedicated to my project. And if that doesn't sound stressful enough, imagine trying to schedule a makeup show on the academy calendar when the musical, 
telegrams, the delta mu trip, honor society inductions, and the oratorical are all happening in the same term. If you're imagining hard enough, you'll get just a glimpse of how I felt when I had to schedule my show for April 8th. For perspective, that date was set in February, just a month prior. In addition, I was also in a sport, which took up two extra day hours of my day after school. I had two months leading up to my show to conceptualize, sculpt, cast, and mold, and apply six different makeups on six different models. I worked like a madman wherever I wasn't busy, which was often in the late hours of the night. When spring term rolled around, I had a week and a half before my show to complete my makeups and entire afternoons to do so. In those few weeks, I had a lot of doubts. I loved what I was doing, but I felt like I was in over my head. I felt like my topic was weird and unusual, and like nobody would be proud of my work. The cracked molds and failed prosthetic materials were problems that I didn't anticipate. In the end, I resolved every issue thrown my way, but by the time the show swung around, I still had major anxiety. <sighs> the reason I created the show in the first place was to show other people what I had accomplished and to show my research on how makeup enhances productions. But I became too worried about what they were going to think about my project. My project. And that's when I realized that this is something that I chose for myself. The pressure of showing other people my work got to me so much that I almost forgot the reason I was presenting it. My goal from the beginning was to be creative and make something that I would be proud of. And looking back at it now, I am proud of it. I'm proud of all six of it. But most of all, I'm proud of the progress I made throughout the year. In Senior Project, I was told every day to focus more on the journey and less on the destination. While I love the prosthetics I made and I enjoy the support I got at my event, I am the most grateful for the experience. Just hours before I started writing this presentation, somebody said to me, it's funny how you work the whole year for just one event and then suddenly it's done. It was an interesting thing to hear because I agreed but I also disagreed. When my show was over, I felt like everything had ended so suddenly and like I had nothing left to do. I didn't feel like my work had been for nothing, though. Although the past few months had been stressful, they were also full of irreplaceable, unexpected moments. Like, for example, when I look at this photo, I don't just see the wood nymph that I created or the nose that I stuck onto her, I see the black blanket that I hung over a bathroom stall door acting as a backdrop. <laughs> I look at this photo and I see an orc that looks like a smurf because the paint was too blue the first time that I applied it. Those things remind me that while I was focused so hard on completing my project, I did have fun while doing it. And I remember that, although his face was too blue the first time, Timmy's makeup looked right the second time around. It was mixed better, it was applied better, and it stayed on longer after only two tries. Imagine what I could accomplish after trying it again three times, or four, or even five. That's what this project has done for me. It has taught me to be optimistic about my work and to enjoy every little moment, no matter how stressful. A major part of my project was centered around enjoying the little moments. This part was called my service piece, in which I was required to use the skills that I'd learned to help somebody else. For my service piece, I served as a makeup artist for Aspen Klippenstein for her short film, Nikki. I contributed hours to my service piece alone, on top of the work I was doing for my show. When I saw the film, I felt an immense sense of pride. It felt rewarding to see my work in action on screen and to see the joy that I was able to bring others with my skills. The hours I spent doing Aspen's makeup are some of the most memorable ones of the year, from the times I got the makeup first perfect the first time around, to the times where I had to mess up a few times to get it right. Aspen always apologized for being too picky, 
but I never thought that she was. Instead, I saw it more as an opportunity to see into the world of a professional makeup artist. Not only was I working for a professional production, I was working for a client. I got to see my research come to life in her film and add to her production in a small yet important way. Of course, I wasn't the only person helping her out, similarly to how I had many people helping me out. Among those people is my project mentor, Christina Orthwine. Christina, while simultaneously teaching pottery at the college and photography at the high school, very graciously agreed to help me after I searched far and wide for a mentor. Finding a mentor was a journey in itself. I had difficulty finding someone in the area who had experience in the makeup field and who had time for me. Christina was the perfect mentor and no, I'm not just saying that because she's in the audience. <laughs> I'm saying that because she checked every box. She had exposure to makeup and special effect makeup specifically. And she wasn't overbearing. She gave me space to be creative in my own way. When it came to sharing ideas, she offered advice on time management and photos rather than on my makeup designs. Christina expressed joy whenever I accomplished something and showed concern when I was struggling. Our relationship was one that made me feel mature because she treated me like an adult while still being there to support me. When I was starting my project, I didn't think that I needed or wanted a mentor. But meeting Christina helped me realize that I need help sometimes, and it's okay if I can't do everything on my own. Even when she wasn't directly involved in a task, I knew that I could count on her to help me in any situation. A need for help is not a bad thing. This is something else that I learned about myself this year. My mom, the models who acted in my show, my teachers, Mr. Dylan Odner and Mr. Corey Boyce, and the makeup artists that gave me supplies and advice are only a handful of people that aided me, along with Christina, in my journey. Every small contribution ultimately made my project possible and made my project successful. I was the one that accomplished my project, and I was the one with the ideas, but in the end, they were what made the process an unforgettable one, one that I will be proud of for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll take questions. Yeah. What do you want to do for a career instead of special effects? Um, the question was, what do I want to do for a career instead of makeup? Um, the answer to that is illustration. I'm going to art school for graphic design and illustration. So basically, my life revolves around art itself, but just a different kind of art. Um, Yeah, the question, the question was, do I see myself going back to art, um, going back to makeup through the art that I'm doing in college? And I think that I will definitely be doing this as a hobby. I just don't think I'll have a lot of time in the near future. I definitely still see myself doing this and incorporating it into my art. How long does each prosthetic last? How long does each prosthetic last? Um, each prosthetic lasts a pretty long time. The paint wears off after a bit. So these are the ones that I actually used in the film and or in the show. And um, this is just one that I made more recently without paint on it. Um, but yeah, they all last as long as you need them to, um, depending on how many times that you apply them to each model. Yep. Which characters did I do for Shrek? That was the question. Um, so I made a nose very similar to this one for the character of the elf. That was Annika Wallace. Um, I did Shrek makeup. So I made a bald cap and I did all of the Shrek ears for the production. So there were five Shrek characters and I made all the ears for that. Um, and then that's about it. Oh, and I made the horns for my character, the dragon. I made the horns for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone who did this. I really forgot. <laughs> um, last question. Did your work with prosthetics uh, change or affect the way you do general makeup? 
did my work with prosthetics change the way I do my normal makeup? Yes, I would say. Um, I don't think it necessarily affected beauty makeup, which was a very different kind of makeup, um, but I think it's definitely impacted how I see special effects makeup as a whole because beforehand, like I said, I was just doing cuts and a lot of the gory side of the special effects makeup, so I, it definitely is a very different process and I think that I would love to incorporate prosthetic into the gory part as well. Um, yeah, it's definitely changed my view on the whole aspect of special effects makeup. Thank you. What a mystical way to end the evening. To wrap it all up, I'd like to thank you all again for coming and remind you that we have three more nights of presentations with three or four speakers each. Those presentations are this Tuesday, the 15th, this Thursday, the 17th, and next Tuesday, the uh, 22nd. Um, and these are all at 7 p.m. here in the auditorium. Thank you all again, and have a great evening. I can never, I can't, I... Um, <laughs> sorry.